We all know that real estate has created more millionaires than any other industry on the planet. We also know that it has created a lot of heartache due to mismanagement, overborrowing, and just simple life events that happen to all of us. Welcome to the Cash Flow Pro Podcast. My name is Casey Brown, and I am your fearless leader. And although we might be bourbon sipping and at times foul mouth Southerners, we will always do our best to be honest, straightforward, and due diligent with all of the information we pass along to you. Welcome to the show. Hey there, and welcome to today's episode of Cash Flow Pro your daily real estate investing podcast and YouTube channel. And today I am here with Yannick Cujo Virgil of, uh, hang on, I had to get that out of, I had to make sure I said that right. So I got (laughs) off track, but with Merlin Acquisitions. So Yannick, how are you today? I'm great. I'm awesome, Casey. Man, that's great. As well. How are you? Oh, d- thank you so much for being here with us. We're so we're kind of excited about this, and and it's uh, it's just not every day that uh, I, I have to tell the listeners up front. Uh, Yannick used to play in the NFL. He is so. Let's get the stardom out of the way so that we can hear his real estate investing story and his story about how he got to where he is today. So, Yannick, I'm going to let you kind of take the take the reins here. Tell us a little bit about you know where you were growing up and how you grew up and what you saw that that eventually led you down the path to say, man, I really want to be involved in the syndication world. Not not that you were thinking about syndications when you were when you were a kid or anything, but I'm just saying what kind of things led you to want to have an interest in the real estate business? Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for, uh, for having me. So my background, as you stated, is in the professional sports realm. I played for the Tennessee Titans, uh, originally from Baltimore, Maryland. And, um, you know, fortunately I had an opportunity to play professionally. It's always, it was always my dream. Um, Unfortunately, I had a career ending knee injury my rookie year, tore my patella tendon. And, you know, my kind of red pill moment, you know, stemmed from just rehabbing and figuring out, you know, am I going to to be able to get back on the field? Right. You know, we had a new GM coming from the Patriots. And I'm pretty sure some of the listeners who are sports fans know the Patriots doors are in and out. Right. So, you know, everyone was scared in the locker room. And I just kind of thought to myself, hey, what am I going to do after football? Right. I have this knee injury. I've had, you know, three surgeries so far. You know, what am I going to do? And fortunately, you know, I picked up the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I'm pretty sure you probably, you know, read that book. And that book was seriously just transformational, um, really, because that same month I spent twenty thousand dollars in one month. And I still to, to this day really have no idea what I spent it on. And so after just after doing that and after reading the book, I really said to myself, hey, I really I really have to be a little bit more smarter when it comes to finances, because I don't know when I'll be able to get back on the field. You know, you've heard a statistic, probably, you know, 78 percent of professional athletes go broke within three years of leaving the, the league. And so I did not want to be part of that statistic. So fortunately, I got I uh, wish that poor dad. I read that I got on bigger pockets, just started, you know, infusing myself with knowledge and wanted to get into the commercial real estate space. So started off in brokerage, uh, joined a couple firms, uh, corporate asset management for private equity firms, uh, you know, specializing in institutional and retail capital as an asset manager and, um, you know, started flipping houses and jumped up into, into the syndication space. And here I am today. Awesome, man. That's such a, that's a, that's a great way to come in. I mean, you know, and the fact that, that you had the opportunity to either, uh, I don't want to say like lay around and wine and whatever, and, or, or the opportunity to say, Hey, this is the hand I was dealt. Let's go. And man, to just, I think that's, that's part of the, the professional athlete that I think a lot of people miss because there's so much noise on TV and so many, so many different, just, just, we hear the highlights of, of the athletes being whatever they are or however they're acting or whatever, but the fortitude that you guys carry to get to the point where you got is, is fortitude and stubbornness that, that not a lot of people understand. 
I mean, there's, there's virtually no way for the average person to understand that you woke up every single day and you had one thing on your mind and it was brown. It was, I don't know what shape that is, football shape. And that was, that was what you eat, slept, breathed. That's what you did. And uh, again, so, so that fortitude to say, Hey, okay, I can't do this, but I'm going to take that same, I, I, all I have to do is kind of shift here. Right. Is that, that's kind of way and Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, entrepreneurs, people who are highly successful, whether it's being in the 1% that actually makes it to the NFL or just being a high performance entrepreneur, I think, you know, the common characteristic is just being able to really immerse yourself and become an expert at what you do on a daily basis. And kind of like you said, right, just have that fortitude every single day. I'm going to do whatever it takes to get there or get better today. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. Just wanted to, to divert that energy from the professional sports realm to real estate. Yeah. And it seems like you've done a fabulous job of that. I mean, and what now now take us back a little bit. Now, what year what year are we what year or years are we kind of talking about here? So we're talking. So I graduated from the university in 2014. Um, my first year in the league was 2015 and I retired 2017. Gotcha. So right about that late 2017-ish timeline is when I actually made the decision to shift into real estate. Cool. So you played your first year, 2015, at the Tennessee Titans, and then and then spent the next two years kind of rehabbing and figuring out if you were going to be able to, to, to get it done or not. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, it was, you know, a really tough time just trying so hard to get back into the NFL. And, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, just the, the, the mental struggles that you have to deal with from being a guy that's, you know, trying to keep his spot on the team. I mean, you know, people come in during the season, think of every, you know, uh, Tuesday, right. In the NFL Tuesdays are days off. Um, and every Tuesday, you have about 10 guys coming in to try out to take your spot. And, and think about that in the corporate life, right? If you had people that were coming in every single week to, to take your job, what type of mental pressure that would be on you? Yeah. So, you know, um, you know, it was a lot within that two-year period, but... You know, fortunately, I found uh, real estate investing. Awesome, man. That's great. So let's kind of shift towards that that end of things and, and let's get away from from what got you where you were, where you were. And let's kind of shift into and say, let's talk about your first deal. I mean, when you first got into this space and and you said, hey, I've, I've got to I've got to go down this path or I want to go down this path. What uh, you said, you started in the brokerage side of things where I'm assuming you listed and sold or, or, or something along those lines, correct? Yes, yes. More specific to the uh, commercial real estate space. So, you know, I started off in brokerage, uh, focused on multifamily investment sales because I knew that I wanted to get into the commercial space um, and office and retail tenant rep. So, um, you know, doing some boutique, you know, small neighborhood retail um, leasing, but also, you know, focusing on the multifamily investment sales. Awesome. And then that that led you like, so we're talking like 2018, 2019, and then yes. 2020, something like that led you to um, to to the syndication world. And well, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, started, you know, uh, 20 say 2018, 2019 was when, you know, during my brokerage kind of phase. And, and then I moved into the uh, asset management space uh, for retail and institutional uh, private equity companies. Um, and actually a few weeks ago, um, I quit my job <laughs> officially. So I'm full-time syndication. Awesome, dude. And that's, that's probably the most kick-ass thing I've heard all day long. Uh, I mean, <laughs> that, you know, I mean, that's, sorry, man. I, that, that's, that's awesome, dude. That's so like, Thank I you. love to hear that. That's great. Uh, what was your degree in? Kinesiology. 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 Man. Yep. I thought that I was going to play 10 years in NFL and own a gym and just sail off into the sunset. Wow. <laughs> Man, isn't that something? And God had big, God had different plans and, now he uh now you're here with us and and hopefully uh hopefully we're all on this journey together so so let's talk about your first syndication and i want to i want to kind of lead into you know we we talked a little bit about the 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 people that you would like to to serve in the future as far as potential investors and so on but let's talk about your first syndication what was what were some of the things that you determined 
were things that needed to be tackled first. Uh, proverbially tackled first. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my first indication, you know, was on the GP side of things were, um, was an, actually an 18 unit deal uh, in Baltimore, Maryland. And, um, you know, it was in a, it was in a great uh, location relative to, uh, to other parts of Baltimore city. And, um, you know, some of the things that we wanted to put in place before we started fishing out for deals was really just getting that capital together, okay. you know, um, but even beforehand was really focusing on what is our investment strategy, yep. right? Because um, I think that's something that's really important as investors to really figure out, okay, you know, start from the foundation. You know, what am I actually trying to achieve? You know, our goal is to create passive income that allows us to pass it on for generations and generations to come. And we found that multifamily was a great investment vehicle in the commercial real estate to do so. So we started off, you know, we wanted to, we wanted to do the, the multifamily mm-hmm. uh, investment. And then, you know, we wanted to get the capital together. And I think a lot of people, you know, contrary to what some people say, you know, if you find a deal, the money would come. Um, I am, I do not agree with that. <laughs> I think that you, that money, it comes down to money, right? You know, you can have a deal tomorrow, but can you actually purchase it? So we wanted to make sure that we had the capital lined up to actually do the deal. And then from there, from us getting the capital, then we started reaching out to brokers, uh, fortunately, I met my partner who was a syndicator prior to us doing business together, and we formed a relationship and started really going out there and talking to brokers, talking to properties, I'm sorry, um, you know, touring properties and really building that team. And by him being a syndicate, a syndicator, you know, I just leveraged his relationships with attorneys, um, his property management company, all the infrastructure that he had to go out and do my own first deal with him. Awesome. Awesome. Now, obviously that, so you, so you, so you have the money lined up and in the meantime, you're built, well, you have the soft commitments. I, I assume, correct. Okay. Yes. So you've got the soft commitments lined up and now you're building relationships with the brokers and you're trying to find, you know, you're, you're, you're basically just kind of stirring here, seeing what kind of comes to the top, right? Okay. Yes. And what was the first deal that jumped out and, and, or how many deals did you have to underwrite before the first deal really jumped out and you were like, Whoa, here it is. <laughs> well, you know, it, one of those businesses and, and, you know, just real estate in general, it's, you know, you really have to think about underwriting a 100 to submit on 10 and probably get one. That's right. right. So it's, you know, it's, it's a, it's a really big fishing game. You know, you really have to open up your lead pipe pipeline to, to actually get a deal. So when we were able to find a deal that made sense financially, it penciled out, you know, we were able to move on it quickly, not only because we had the capital, but also because we had the market knowledge from owning other properties in the area. Uh, my partner owned a property in the area as well. So we actually had a really good business plan from past experience, from knowing the market and, um, you know, trusting our real estate experience to actually go out and execute the business. Plan. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's there again, it, it comes down to, you know, one of the things that, that when you, when you step back and you start looking at, at what, what makes a good real estate syndicator or, or like, look at, look at attributes that, that some of the best syndicators have. And it's almost, almost undeniably true that, all of them come from some type of a process background, some type of a, a back, and you're none, you're not any different. You could, because, because every day you'd get up, you had the, you had these processes and then, then those daily processes were lengthened out into weekly processes and the weekly processes lengthened out into monthly processes. And it's the same thing. And I always, I've always said that like, like the majority of, of the passive investors that, that at least we see are somehow related in the medical field or somehow related in the uh, engineering field. And those are two of the, of the most probably processized, if that's even a word, uh, 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 careers. And so with that being said, so you, you go out and you're underwriting, you said underwriting a hundred to submit LOIs on 10 or to even have 10 picked out, I guess, and then, and then close on one. And what was that, what was that first one and how many doors was it? The first one was an an 18 unit syndication. 18 units. Wow. And then, and then what was the raise? What was the total raise? Um, The total raise for this deal actually was $450,000. And the reason that it was so 
quote unquote low was because we were able to to strategically get uh, some construction of perm financing with the local credit union. Uh-huh. And, you know, obviously now we talk about rates, you know, increasing and, you know, the Fed just raised rates, you know, about a month ago. And the forward curve is looking pretty scary for a lot of real estate investors, particularly that, particularly that you know, that acquire um, mm-hmm. uh, debt. You know, we wanted to make sure that we protect our investors from anything down the road. So what we were able to do was structure uh, construction of perm debt, you know, so we didn't necessarily have to raise all of the rehab funds which was about, you know, 500000 to do the complete uh, value add position. You know, it allowed to really get um, lower capital to the table, which obviously boosted returns for our investors. So that was really good with that deal. You know, it allowed us to get uh, about 4.5% going under construction and then a fixed rate uh, on the permanent. Hey, I'm going to pause this here for just a second. Something, we're getting some kind of feedback from your microphone. Is your it's probably my phone buzzing. Okay, there we go. Is that it? Sorry about that. Is it better? Yes, much better. Oh my gosh. Much better. Much better. Let's uh all right, let's I'm gonna I wanna go back. Um let's go back and and uh they'll they'll edit all this out, you know. Um yeah. so when when you were tell us let's see, I'm trying to think where we let's see. So on the on the eighteen unit syndication, and we were looking at you said a four hundred and fifty thousand dollar raise, and where now where did you go to find investors? Yeah, so our investors really just came from our network. Um, you know, people who were busy professionals, kind of like what you mentioned. You know, engineers. You know medical providers, people who are really looking for a return in today's market, and also professional athletes as well, you know, athletes who have earned, you know, a good amount of capital in the NFL and, you know, who really understand the the benefits of uh, putting that money to work and actually seeing that grow slowly but surely. Sure. Uh, so we were able to raise those funds and, and purchase the 18-unit deal, and, you know, we were able to get really good financing on it. Uh, we were able to secure a construction of perm note on it, which allowed us to not have to raise an extra 500000 towards closing the project. You know, it allowed, a, allowed us to really just lever up a little bit to, you know, get lower proceeds that we would need to close on the transaction. Sure. Um, so that was really good. We were really excited about that, considering where rates are today and where the forward curve is looking in the future projection. Sure, sure. Now, do you, did you take that deal full cycle or is it still, is it still, uh, do you still have it? Yeah, we, we still have it. And we're, you know, we're almost halfway through our business plan and, and things are moving, you know, progressing in a positive direction. And we're excited about it. You know, we're excited about it. And, um, you know, we were projecting well over a 2x multiple over a five year period. So we're super excited about, you know, closing this deal. Shoot, yeah, man. And so what was the total purchase price? And you said it went from a con- you, you, you got in with a credit union where you got construction to perm financing. And what what was the total purchase price, the capital raise, and everything included? Yeah, so the to- total purchase price was one point three two five okay. for eighteen units. So we wow. just had to raise about, yeah, we just we just had to raise about you know four hundred and fifty thousand, and the rehab budget was around five hundred thousand. So the bank for, included the rehab budget. I'm assuming in the initial loan, you raised twenty uh, percent or whatever for that, and then and then and then what did it give you like a 12 month window to do the, to do those repairs? And then after 12 months or something, it converted to permanent. Yeah. So actually we were able to negotiate two years of interest only. Oh, wow. And yeah, that's really great. Right. Because we, we, at first we wanted to take it to agency, obviously for the non recourse option. And from there, you know, we really didn't find any options from, from the actual agency lenders that would be feasible for this particular project. Sure. So uh, we took it to a smaller bank who really, you know, re- they really fight for business like this, you know, the smaller multifamily space, they don't get to see the big 100 unit properties, 50 unit properties. Yeah. And so we were able to negotiate interest only debt, um, you know, and we were able to get the rehab funds looped into the original loan, which, you know, served as a construction loan for the first two years, and then it would convert to PERM, um, which turned into a fixed rate, um, you know, for 15 years. We priced every five years over 
a five-year treasury uh, benchmark. So we were super excited about uh, placing the right debt on that property. Sure. Yeah, that's awesome. Now, what about your second? I mean, how many deals have you done? Have you done more than just that one? Or Yeah, so we've done two deals so far. We also did a 22-unit deal, um, which was similar uh, location, similar structure. We went to a different credit union. Um, three years interest only on that. You know, the rate was much better at 3.75 construction debt converted to perm, same structure, and, you know, things are working out well. Sure. Now, what's what does the, uh, on that converted to perm uh, or converted to permanent financing, I guess, for the listeners that may be wondering what we're talking about. Hi, this is Casey Brown, host of the Cashflow Pro podcast and YouTube channel. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate but just don't know where to begin? I'd like to help by inviting you to check out our website at www.3000capital.com. There you will find an array of material that will help you learn all about real estate syndication. And while you're there, be sure to check out our free video series download titled Five Must Know Keys to Success in Passive Real Estate Investing. I'd also like to personally thank you for making Cashflow Pro part of your day. Now, back to the show. Um was there is there some type of an interest rate cap or or is there obviously they i don't know that they could hedge the interest rate out that far as far as taking on like old money versus new money. i mean is that or what what does that interest rate look like three years down the road yeah so, so when it converts um, to permanent sorry yeah so when, so for both both properties you know when it converts to permanent it's actually a fixed rate um you know, that's repriced every five years over a five-year treasury plus a spread. Okay. So if we say that, you know, for the first deal, the 18-unit deal, two years interest only plus a five-year fixed period, we have seven years to be protected, so to speak, before we, you know, see some sort of change in our interest so rate. So you know what that Same interest thing. rate's going to be for seven years? Correct. Awesome. Correct. That's great. Yeah. Shoot. Yeah. And then, and then of course, it... Yeah, like you said, it'll just reprice based on. And a lot of times they have floors and ceilings. It can only reprice so much. Uh, you yeah. Know, so yeah, that's man, that's great. And then, and especially the fact that it just kind of converts after after the short interest only period. Of course, the interest only period is when you kind of try to build up those reserves and build up the backlog of so you have some cash on hand to replace an HVAC unit or something like that. So, um, and, Absolutely. and, uh, so, so you're, you were talking a little bit earlier right before we, before we jumped on the show that, um, you were hoping to, to potentially put together maybe a, um, a network of some professional athletes that are maybe like kind of cater to them so that you can, if you were to start a fund, you would be trying to, to, to work in with them because obviously you have a, you have, the 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 community there that you could reach out to and hopefully you know kind of work your way in right absolutely absolutely and i think there's an, an amazing opportunity from that perspective um considering that you know professional athletes kind of keep uh they they talk to each other more than they would talk to anyone that wasn't in that locker room, sure right sure um and so being able to 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 use that network to to help folks, you know, protect their 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 wealth. To help folks, um, you know, get a return on their money. You know, it's 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 it's. I'm super excited to to have that opportunity. I think, you know, in the professional athlete space, you know, a lot of them, you know, even myself when I came out of the University of Maryland and then went to the NFL, you know, I didn't necessarily have investment knowledge. Sure. You know, I knew about saving. My parents taught me a lot about saving, saving, saving. But when it came to actually making some um, you know, financially astute uh, decisions, you know, on the investment side, I really didn't know what to do with the money, right? So it's kind of like giving a child or a kid, you know, that went from being a broke college student to signing a multi-million dollar contract, you know, in a few months, yeah. right? You know, anyone that has that type of money and is still, you know, very, relatively young at 21 years old, you know, they're just, <laughs> they just got done partying, right. right? So that's right. Um, you know, just providing folks or, uh, you know, specifically to the professional athlete space with an opportunity to not only um, preserve their wealth, but also grow it as well is something that we were really excited about and we're really passionate about considering that I was literally in that phase 
you know, a few years ago. Yeah, it hadn't been that long. I mean, you're not that far separated from it as, as far as, and, it, and it's, you know, the opportunity, I, I assume the opportunity to be able to tap that network is probably like anything else. It gets just a little bit of a smaller possibility every day that goes by that you, that you, you know, when you start looking back, you know, start leveraging that and start saying, hey guys, come over here and check this out. I want to help, you know, and, and I'm sure that, as as a professional athlete, whether it, for any sport, I'm sure they're inundated with with just people. I mean, everybody wants a piece, right? And so, you know, you oftentimes have to 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 be able to separate the or focus on who you can and can't trust because I'm sure there's the majority that you cannot trust. And, you know, you see it all the time on TV and, you know, so-and-so escaped with such and such amount of money that, that, or, or fraud or whatever. And so, yeah, I mean, that it, it definitely, you definitely have an end there with somebody to have a, to have a, um, a discussion and then it turns to, Hey, can I help you or something like that? So that's awesome, man. Um, so what does the future look like? Let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, what does the future look like and are you, are you just kind of going to, you said something about starting a fund, which I think we covered. And then are you looking at just, are you looking at any deals right now or how, how, what does it look like on the deal front right now? Absolutely. So we have a goal by the end of the year to be 500 doors on the management. And hopefully we're, we're hoping to, uh, to do some bigger deals to, to, to get to that number. What's the total right um, now? What's the total right now? The total right now, on this, on, just on the syndication space only, I own properties, you know, personally, but just on syndications, 40 units. Oh, wow. So we got right 460 now. to go, man. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's a couple of big properties, right? We, we can do it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, as, as far as the future, you know, we're, we're always looking at deal flow primarily in the Baltimore market, and we're looking to expand outside into Virginia and Philly, some of the surrounding markets, and in the mid-Atlantic. And as far as deal flow, I think right now we're still looking for deals, but figuring out where pricing is given, you know, the rates that are coming up, right? I think right now is really a good time to really structure your debt for the future and figuring out, you know, okay, you know, the, the rates are going to be here today. Here's what we expect, but what is it going to look like in the future, two to three years down the line where we might refinance from uh, a value add deal into a permanent agency loan and figuring out, okay, how are they going to see leverage on debt moving forward? You know, how are we going to price the loan proceeds in in a few years? You know, how are we going to exit out of these properties if they're expecting rates to continuously increase, yeah. right? So really being strategic about the debt that we place on the property is, is always a number one uh, front for us because debt is always the biggest killer for real estate sure. deals. So if you're not structuring the debt correctly, if you're not being astute in how you're, uh, you know, placing debt on a particular property, you're in for, you know, uh, turmoil, right? So figuring out, you know, how can we place debt on these on these properties? And then also, um, you know, what types of returns that we can go out there and get for our investors. Sure. Sure. So we're excited about the future. Awesome, man. Well, I got to say, uh, Yannick and I connected through a mastermind that we're both in called Raise Masters. And of course, I'm always, I'll always give Hunter Thompson and Raise Masters a plug um, because it's really been a community of, of just kind of, we're all, there's, there's not a lot of taking, but there's a lot of giving. Um, and, and, there, and we, of course I say there's not a lot of taking, but there's, you take from what somebody else gives you when, in the form of knowledge. And so, um, you know, when you start talking about, these cap rates and, and well, interest rates rising, cap rates compressing and things like that. And, and, and the thought that, you know, at some point we may, there's a very good possibility we may begin to, to, to look at the potential of having to underwrite a negative cap rate. You know what I'm saying? Like, like mm -hmm. a cap rate that, that, that doesn't initially cash flow, like right off the bat, you're losing, you know, you're, you're not making money and that cap rate is negative. So, you know, a lot of that stuff, and, and I've heard Hunter speak about it uh, to at length and, and it's just something that's a very, very good possibility as we move forward with, with the, the, given the, the idea of interest rates, given the idea of prices and given the idea of, of, of just basically the economic landscape in general. So, um, but listen, well, Yannick, I'd like to ask you, uh, what is, uh, what is the best book you've ever read? 
The best book I've ever read. Um, you know, I, I think I'm going to keep it cliche and just say, you know, rich dad, poor dad, to be honest. Okay. I think, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm big on, you know, what has actually changed my thought pattern in life, you know, and what are the big monumental changes that I've experienced and what has caused me to make those changes. And I think just that book alone, you know, I can't wait to just pass it down to my kids because, you know, just being able to change that mindset from being a consumer to an investor sure. and just focusing on, you know, long-term wealth, um, it's truly amazing. And just being able to uh, quit my job, you know, a few weeks ago and, and, and have that passive income to actually replace it is truly amazing. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's what I would say, you know, my, uh, the best book I've read. Awesome, is. man. Now, where is, uh, what's the best, uh, trip that you've ever taken or where is, a, where is, uh, somewhere like a dream trip that you'd like to take? Yeah, I would say that the best trip that I've taken so far, um, was the trip, uh, I think a year and a half ago to Tulum, Mexico with my girlfriend. Uh, we had an amazing time out there. We were able to actually uh, swim across from stingrays and and do a whole bunch of just, you know, visiting the Mayan ruins and really just taking a step away from the business life and just relaxing for a little bit. You know, syndications, although it may look, you know, glamorous, you know, when you're starting off growing your business, it's really hard just being, the you know, the, the point of contact for everything in your business, right? So just being able to step back, you know, take, take you know, a couple of days off and just relax you know, it was truly rewarding. It's so every big uh, time. So, yeah. so um, now for the listeners who might have picked something up here or want to reach out to you or somebody that needs to wants to get in touch to learn more about the potential of maybe even investing with you, what's the best way for them to reach out to you? I'm so the best way to reach out to me um, is via email. I'm always happy to have a 10, 15 minute conversation with anyone that's interested in investing in real estate or is interested in our company. Um, and anyone can reach out to me um, through my website. It's called Merlin Acquisitions, M-E-R-L-Y-N-N acquisitions.com um, or my email address, Cujo C-U-D-J-O-E at Merlin acquisitions.com. Again, I'm always happy to have a 10, 15 minute conversation with anyone that's interested in real estate. And the one thing that I want to leave here is just being able to um, perform due diligence in real estate is, is important, right? So if anyone wants a due diligence checklist, feel free to go to my website and get a free checklist as well. I'm always happy to just provide value on all fronts. Awesome, so, man. Thank you well, so much, Johnny, Casey, thank for you having for me. being with us. And we certainly appreciate your time. We know you're a busy man and, and we want to thank you again for being with us. So I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day and thank you for listening to the Cash Flow Pro. Cashflow Pro is hosted by Casey Brown, founder and CEO of 3000 Capital, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and helping them build long-term wealth. If you enjoyed today's podcast, make sure to hit that subscribe button so you'll be notified about all our future episodes. You can find more information about us and our investment philosophy by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thanks for listening.